Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. Um, I guess this is our first episode of our second year. Folks, anybody who tuned in yesterday for our one year anniversary special, thank you so much. Um, it was a love fest for me. That doesn't happen too often. I'm not comfortable with that happening. I don't like it, but I appreciate everybody telling me that they enjoy the show. So thank you all very much. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing to the show. Thank you for liking the show. Um, for everybody that I meet that tells me the show helps educate them on the cannabis industry means the world to me. And I promise I will continue to do this show as long as we continue to get amazing guests. Our guest today is obviously no different from that. Um, you know, it's cool. We've kind of become a, a, a stop for anybody beginning their media tour in the cannabis place. And I really enjoy that because I get to have some really laid back you know, conversations with our guests before they go and do the more official shows and really get into their products and the company and everything else. And as much as I love that, I really like to know the people behind the companies and really just drives them and have some really cool conversations. So taking us all the way back to the first episode of Elevate Your Grind, I always said, if you're going to a conference, there's two types of conversations you're going to see. You're going to see the ones on stage that you see on panels where everyone's prim, proper, and professional. And then there's the other conversations that you have at the networking events, at the happy hours, at the sessions, and all that stuff. And that's what this show is about, is about those conversations. They're a lot more fun. They're a lot more real. And hopefully, you learn a whole lot more from them. On that note, what do we have coming up? Great episode for you today. Tune in tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Eastern right here at uh, facebook.com slash Business Group. We'll be welcoming back one of our first guests, Beth Stavola. Uh, I have not been too in familiar with what Beth has been up to since uh, not being with Ianthus anymore. So I'm really excited to talk to about her about that, talk to her about New Jersey and all that good stuff. So tune in tomorrow. Of course, February 6th, we have the annual C-Lab conference. It is going to be socially distant. We are going to require masks. There will be temperature checks. Uh, that's going to be at the Sacred State Space in Miami. Of course, if you are not comfortable coming in person, feel free to check us out online. You can see that at joinclab.com. I think this year we're going to do a little bit of effort trying to clean up these intros and make them a little bit shorter. But until then, I'm just going to keep rambling until I run out of things to talk about, which is now. So my guest today, um, I mean... He, he's leading the charge in delivery in California right now. He's being involved in a lot of different things. I'm excited to break those down. But honestly, I'm really more excited to hear about his backstory because it's really interesting. Looking at his LinkedIn, there isn't too many other or too many other jobs on there besides the one he has now. So I see this gentleman as someone who has kind of been born and raised in the cannabis space when it comes from a professional standpoint. So please welcome my guest today, Zachary Pitts, the CEO at Ganja Goddess. Zach, thanks for joining me, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Excited. Absolutely. It, it's an honor, man. I, I'm a big fan of the delivery services, especially out in California. Um, and, and I'm going to steal a quote from one of our other guests, but Brady Cobb down here in Florida at one plant, when they opened their doors, their whole thing was forever. How did you buy your cannabis? You called your guy and he brought it to your house. So why are we changing everything? Why are we making people go into a <laughs> store? As much as I love the initial shopping experience at a retailer, as soon as I know what I like, <sighs> delivery is the way for me, man. So I got to ask you, you know, back when you we founded Goddess Delivery, I think it was 2011, was that kind of the same thesis that you had? Yeah, definitely. And it, it, was, it was very driven by uh, my partner, Tara. Um, she she's an older woman, uh, not too old, but uh, she her experience going into the medical shops in California and and back in 2011, it was is much more a wild west of cannabis than it is now. But um, her experience going into the shops was, you know, they were these kind of really not very it wasn't pleasant for her as an older woman. Um, you know, the, there wasn't any decoration. It was, it, there were these huge steel doors. There'd be these really big security guards. She'd come in, be a, a bunch of like young pot pros. And, you know, they're, that's not bad, but it's just as an older woman, she was just like, nothing about this makes me feel comfortable. Nothing about this makes me learn more about cannabis. And um, a lot of what we did was driven by 
let's try to make an alternative for people who might not be as versed in how to get that medical card. They don't know necessarily what type of cannabis they want to smoke. Um, you know, they're interested, but they're just, they're apprehensive about it. Uh, and who aren't, you know, necessarily part of that traditional cannabis culture. And that, that traditional cannabis culture isn't bad. It, it's great. It, it, it's the beginnings of so much of what's happened now, but there's room for other forms of enjoying and medicating on cannabis. And so we, we were trying to create that in our delivery service. We wanted to make sure that people felt comfortable and safe. We wanted to make sure that people felt informed, that they understood what they were taking and why, um, and that they enjoyed the process, that it was something that was pleasant for them. Um, so, when we first started, we really focused on customer service, on making sure that like there was that, that extra step of really getting people to understand, making sure that, that older adults, that a lot of them really could have so much, so many good opportunities for medical outcomes for using cannabis, you know, for smaller things as well as big things. You know, we hear about the cancer and the glaucoma and the HIV and things like that, but you know, when you have like just a constant sore in your knee, when you have arthritis, when you have trouble sleeping or anxiety or you grind your teeth, all these different small things can just really improve your life using cannabis. And we were able to reach those people in ways that traditional cannabis, medical cannabis storefronts weren't. Um, and so that really drove what we did. Uh, the way that Ganja Goddess works, it, it used to be called Goddess Delivers, but now it's Ganja Goddess. Uh, the way that it works is that we deliver pretty much anywhere in California, but it's next day. It's, so it's not going to come in 30 minutes or an hour. Um, but we really kind of focus on, you know, a curated menu where I, I was just talking to my, my wife about this last night, actually, how she really appreciates how if we have something on our menu, it's going to be good. Everyone here likes it or has enjoyed it. And if we get feedback from a customer that it's not working for them, or if we get enough feedback like that, we go back to the producer and we're like, you got to take this back. This isn't working for us. And so it's, 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 I don't know how to, I don't know how to capture it precisely in words. It's, it's not quite like lifestyle, but it's, it's, it's just, we want to create that trust. Basically. I want to create that trust. I get what you're saying too. And when you, when you're delivering to the entire state, right. You know, especially now, right. You really want, there's a lot of people, I don't want to say like myself, but people that I know that are really just approaching this industry because part of the reason why they weren't experimenting with cannabis and everything else was the stigma and all that. But now that yeah. they've educated themselves, they want to try it. Right. And I can even, you know, you talk about Tara's experience and, and I never went to California back then, but I can say as recent as, two, three years ago, going to dispensaries in both LA and San Diego, certain dispensaries you would walk into and they still, you ask about products and everything else. And they're, they're pointing you to what has the highest THC. And those of yeah. us in the industry, out of the industry, and especially the legacy consumers, we know that that's not necessarily the best stuff or even the stuff that's going to affect you the most. Right? So I remember, you know, my first foray and my first ventures and specifically into California dispensaries, even as someone who was a regular consumer, lightly educated, you know, I, at least I knew Indica Sativa, I knew some strains here and there, um, it was intimidating. It was intimidating because the selection was giant. There were so many different brands, so many different types of products that realistically, I needed a lot of time in that store to figure out what I truly wanted. And the, the California dispense, even the dispensary system anywhere isn't really meant for that there aren't too many stores that where they really want you to linger because you're dealing with a dedicated bud tender that needs to move on to the next customer and they need to move people through the store so i can absolutely see the need of what you're talking about and it's really cool that if you have someone in california that's statewide delivering that they kind of are trusted like hey if it's on our menu you're probably going to enjoy it right and it's funny i i I have a lot of the conversations you talk about, about the legacy cannabis community and the culture. And there is always going to be a place for that. And it's always going to be people that we've built, you know, this empire on their backs and they laid the groundwork. 
But just like with any industry, if we, we turn to alcohol, right? And we look at wine, we look at craft beer. There are the people that have the culture, they have the knowledge, they only drink the what they consider to be the best stuff from the best areas and everything else. And I don't think that a lot of, it's probably gonna piss a lot of people off. I don't think that a lot of people in the legacy culture realize that not everybody is going to be that into their products, right? They just kind of, they wanna be marketed the Budweiser, the Bud Light or whatever's gonna be the mainstream product because it's just easier for them and it's more convenient. And then there are going to be the next level consumers that are really going to want to start to intimately know their product. And then you're going to have the connoisseurs and that's where the culture comes in. Right. So, you know, I really respect what you guys have done because not every company needs to focus on the culture. The people in the culture have their own co companies for the most part. And that's awesome. And trust me, many times I'm going to step up and buy those products, but for the most part, I'm cool with a, a Lowell or a candescent or you know, one of these major California brands. I mean, if I really want to get into it, like a Northern Emerald. So, you know, it's cool that you have that. I'm interested. You talked about how Gondry Goddess worked as next day delivery here in Florida. That would still be great. California, I know things are different, but if you have a larger stock, I can absolutely see the attraction. How, are, do you, are you guys almost a, dis, even though it's a delivery service, are you guys kind of a dispensary yourself where you're buying wholesale and then selling retail to your consumers? Or is there another yeah. level of interest to see there? So in California, the license, they have two different license types. They have a, a retail storefront license and a non-storefront, uh, retail non-storefront. The storefronts, they can all deliver, presuming that, you know, the city allows them to deliver, to deliver. Um, but the non-storefronts, those are only delivery. So we don't have a, um, a store that customers can come into. Um, but yeah, we so we deliver. And the idea of kind of delivering all over the state, but on a slower timescale, on a next day delivery, is that we can reach areas um, that just doesn't really have access to cannabis. Um, one of the ways this is that California, every state has its own weird kind of system. Yeah. And California's weird system is that um, it's very close. Licensing is very closely tied to both state and city. And so, so the state has let me, let me interrupt you have once. Let me interrupt you oh, one sure. second, because I really like what you're going into here. And, you know, you make a really good point because from the outsider's point of view, we look at California and, and we just think it's legal everywhere, right? You think yeah. if you're in California, you're able to get it. So obviously that's not the case. Sorry, if just go on, but I want to make that point. Yeah. Yeah. So basically there are a lot of cities that haven't made it legal to, to put a dispensary or any operation within the city limits. So we can still deliver into those cities uh, to residents of the cities, but we can't uh, have our operation in that city. And so that means that there are people, I, I think uh, the last uh, uh, statistics I looked at, about 50% of the state of California has to drive up to like 40 miles, 40 miles or wow. more to get to a storefront. So we're able to reach people in these smaller communities that are still really interested, uh, but just don't have much access otherwise. Um, and that's, that's, it's, it's exciting for us. It, it's interesting because, you know, based on how your company operates, you, you basically operate like a combination dispensary and logistics service. Like I'm sure that you have yeah. buyers and things like that. And you're constantly meeting with different brands and deciding on who you should carry and whatnot. You know, how much of that is, I will call it R and D versus just looking at data, <laughs> right? When you're, when you're looking at what portfolio is Ganja Goddess going to carry, how do you really start to make those decisions, especially when you're statewide, right? You know, I, as far yeah. as I understand and I'm outside of it, you know, you've, you've almost got a culture battle between Northern California and Southern California. So I imagine each area has their own popular brands. That, yeah, that's true to an extent. Um, I think, I think it's exacerbate or it's exaggerated in the media a little bit, maybe the, 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 the clash between Northern and Southern California. Um, I think in, in terms of cannabis taste, it, it's, pretty universal. There's a little bit of regional differences, but not a huge amount. Um, and on, this, on, the, on the side of data, you know, we do try to collect data. Um, we also try to really just talk to our customers, um, find out like, you know, why are they smoking? What reasons are they smoking? 
what pain points do they have with using cannabis, with ordering cannabis, stuff like that. We're always trying to self-improve. But we also have, you know, I have so much confidence in my staff. Um, we all have opinions on these things and we really want to, we get excited about certain things. And so we'll try to pass on that excitement. You know, there are, there are a couple, you know, we'll go with the larger cultivators, but there are a couple smaller cultivators that we've developed really good relationships with. And some of the stuff that they do, it's just like mind blowing. It's gotten me through the pandemic in some ways. Um, so it's, it's a mix. It's a mix of like, you know, traditional business. It, cannabis business, it, it has to operate like a normal business. And um, in many ways at the beginning, we didn't have to as much, but inevitably, you know, you need to think about, you have to provide healthcare for your employees. You have to make sure that you're paying taxes. You have to do all these things that a normal business does. And that's not as exciting, but, but we do try to really stay connected to like, um, why are we doing this? What is fun about cannabis? What is healing about cannabis? What's joyful for some people, for Tara, what's spiritual about cannabis? And um, just make sure we don't lose sight of that, I guess. Yeah, very interesting. I'm sure it's got to be an amazing feeling when you find a, a smaller cultivator, right? And you're able to bring them onto your platform and really pump them up. I mean, and, and I don't mean to say that as like, oh, you're this big company and you're, you're allowing them to. I mean, me, even as a podcast guest, right? Like, I know that if I get a Steve D'Angelo episode, which, which we have, youtube.com slash elevate your grind, it's going to get views <laughs> because Steve's big, right? Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I really like finding people like Lewis and Cree from Tucana out of Michigan, which is a, a, a technology startup in the space, or Sarah Stewart, who's working high, hospitality, that's working on consumption lounges, people who should have some recognition, but don't yet. So I imagine this, the feeling when you find a small cultivator and you can really kind of portnoy affect them, if we will, you know, we've seen it during this, the whole barstool fun thing. I imagine that's got to be a great feeling for your, for you and your team. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's, um, it's funny because it, in, in California, it was the first one to go medical. And because of that, it had, it had the least definition to its rules. And so it was very, you know, some cities licensed, some didn't. It was very, it was very gray area. And you would have growers that really did incredible things uh, and manufacturers that did really incredible things. And not all of them have converted and so when I'm able to help some of those smaller growers, uh, you know, I, I don't want to puff myself. It's not like, you know, they get onto our platform and suddenly they've made it. It's more like, yeah. you know, the fact that we can have that relationship, it means a lot to me. There's been a lot of people, a lot of those legacy operators that just didn't make it through uh, compliance and, and licensing and all that after uh, 2016. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. No, and, and that's an unfortunate thing. You know, I have a colleague for, for my day job out in California. He's basically saying sometimes regulations come in and it wipes out an entire population of, of retailers. And, and it's crazy yeah. the, the world that we live in now. Um, so I want to kind of back up to the beginning here in your story, right? Because sure. as I mentioned in the intro, LinkedIn, it goes college <laughs> right into to ganja. Gan it got us deliveries, but I know you guys found it, the edibles company first. I mean, listen, yeah. dude, you graduate college and you go, hmm, I want to do something hard. So I'm going to be an entrepreneur. That's not hard enough. So I'm going to be an entrepreneur in the cannabis space before it's <laughs> recreational or illegal. So did you just like, what's the hardest thing I can do in a business standpoint? And then I'm going to do that. Well, um, the funny thing is I, I graduated college um, right before the recession hit. Uh, and... Initially, I, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I tried to do a little bit of um, uh, advocacy there. I was doing like environmental advocacy in D.C. It did not work out well for me. I mean, I enjoyed it, but I don't know. I wasn't that amazing at it. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you come out of college and I just was not one of those people with a whole lot of direction, I guess. Um, and I ended up moving back to, I'm from uh, Los Angeles. I moved back to Los Angeles and I kind of, the, the crash hit and it just got harder and harder to find jobs. And so I kind of just started working with Tara. She had developed this brownie recipe and I came in and 
uh, she was growing a little bit as well. And I came in to assist her and I helped improve the brownie recipe a lot and really improve the, the systems that she was using for um, growing. But, um, and this kind of speaks to my LinkedIn profile. At the time, this is in like, I don't know, 2007, 2008. At the time, you know, it was legal, but it, it really, you know, uh, Bush wasn't a fan of cannabis. Uh, yeah. People were still getting arrested or raided. Um, and so we were just, I would just be very, I wouldn't be open about it. Even with my friends sometimes. I, you know, I didn't talk about it on Facebook. I got very used to just not talking about my job. And if you don't talk about your own job, you can really avoid having people ask you about your job. Or if you don't ask <laughs> other people about their job too. You just, anytime I'd go to a party, I'd find something else to talk about. Um, and so, I, it, it, and it's funny because that, at the beginning, that's just how you were. You like, you just did not talk about it. Um, and it's just changed so much. And now you, you have to talk about it a lot. And uh, it was very, it was very big to like, actually start getting interviewed by reporters. I, I've done a lot of uh, advocacy on cannabis, on the cannabis side of things on the, with trade organizations. And like talking to reporters at the beginning, I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm putting my name out there. <laughs> um, but you know, you, you have to get used to it. It's the change of the industry. It's, it's the legalization, which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, so, so that's how we started. And we just got more and more popular with our brownies. Um, and we, we, around 2010, we started talking about, okay, like where can we take this to the next level? Um, you know, we don't really think we can, we had the resources or the ability to start a storefront at the time, but we, we, would, we were starting to get people across the state asking us for the brownies. Um, and we made a couple other edibles as well. And uh, so we were like, why don't we just find a way to like ship it to them or get it to them across the entire state? And that was, that helped, uh, that was part of the genesis of this idea of delivering it. Um, and yeah, from there, it just, it just kept getting more and more popular. Um, there's some sort of special sauce in how we were connecting with our customers. You know, it, it's, I, I kind of mentioned how we, we really tried to make it open to women, to people who aren't as familiar with cannabis, to older adults. Um, and it, it really, it plays out in our customers. They, they tend to be a lot older than the average cannabis customer. They tend, we have a, I think we're close to 50-50 men to women, which is unusual for uh, retailers. Um, it's usually closer to like 60, 40 men to women. Um, yeah, and that's, I guess that's how we got to here. <laughs> Dude, that, so, I mean, that's an awesome story. So let me ask you the question in 2011, when you're like, okay, or right prior to 2011, when you're like, okay, we got to figure out how to ship this to people or get it to them across the state. Where was delivery from a regulation or a licensing standpoint? Because it, I think what 2000, it was later that it became full rec where I imagine you know, delivery was a little bit more acceptable from, but from a medical standpoint, you know, did you guys kind of have to help create the regulations around delivery or was delivery a thing then? And you're like, Hey, it's a thing. Now we got to pounce on it because this is what we've been talking about. Yeah. There were not many delivery services when we first started. Um, and a, a lot of the hurdle at the beginning was people used to the illicit market who are like, I call up my dealer. And I say, you know, I want a couple things, but also just bring a suitcase and show me what you got type of thing. <laughs> um, and so you had to explain to them like, well, you know, we want you to pay in advance. You know, we have a menu that you order from. You can go online and order. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, was, it, was, it was teaching people like, oh, we can be similar to like the e-commerce that you're used to. Um, but this kind of speaks to that, that California being first, but also being a wild west. A lot of the California law was ill defined. Like it just didn't say anything. It didn't make it illegal, but it didn't say like, this is how you do it if you do do it yeah. legally. Um, and so you kind of really had to work out with your lawyers what's best practices and what is a good idea versus a bad idea. What's going to make them annoyed at So the other thing is like, you know, you could be operating according to every law that you could find legally. 
But then, you know, if the cops came by, they'd be like, well, we don't think so. So we're going to take all of your money and all of your supply and you're going to have to sue us to get it back. And you probably won't succeed. And now your operation is done. So it was a, it, it was a very stressful time <laughs> of life. Um, and you kind of, you really just, you, you had to do what you thought was best because there just wasn't any guidance. Yeah, I can imagine that was a hard time to operate. Is that what kind of led you? I mean, I know it was a much later on, but to, to have the delivery, uh, the, the industry associations, I noticed that you're president yeah. of, president and director of one, president of the other, president of the California Cannabis Delivery Alliance and director at Los Angeles. So, I mean, I imagine yeah. at some point, you know, you kind of had to get everybody together and say, hey, there's got to be some kind of normalization here. Yeah, I mean, we... We started up the local, the Los Angeles Delivery Alliance because we were trying to get local licensing. We had to lobby the city and talk to the city and introduce them to even the concept of cannabis. Uh, because at the beginning, you know, legislators and city councilors, they look at cannabis and they're like, oh my God, this is like, I don't know, nuclear waste. We got to have like tons of cameras and security and like, you know, what, who knows what type of hooligans are going to be like taking this stuff. And, you know, we have to tell them like, no, no you know, your, your father, your son, everyone, you know, they're taking it, they, they'll be into it too. This is something that everyone can enjoy. It's not, you know, it doesn't turn people into like reefer mad, you know, killers or something like that. Um, so we, we, yeah, we, we, there's a lot of education and we started this really to just try to make sure that we had a delivery license option, that there were rules for delivery, um, that it wasn't left out like it was in the medical arena. Um, and we accomplished a lot of that. I, I'm very proud of, of what you know my peers in the delivery space did to get the laws and regulations where they are now. And actually, in fact, at this point, a lot of these organizations, um, it's a little bit outdated, we folded into other organizations. We, We've started allying with what's called the Southern California Coalition. We've gotten all the delivery groups in. We're getting a lot of the local storefront retail groups and um, some social equity groups uh, and some other statewide groups. And um, it's really kind of trying to unify our voice at this point, make sure that when we're talking to legislators, they're not hearing five different things from five different uh, operators and make sure that, you know, now that they've had a couple of years to see us, they know that we're not nuclear waste, as I said, that, that, that they can treat us in a similar way as they do beer or alcohol. Yeah, that, I mean, it's probably a very smart move to make sure that you have that unified voice because I'd imagine most people in the industry kind of have the same goal. Now, obviously you're dealing with something on this topic, but let's pin that and come back to it because a few topics I want to sure. touch on, I have a feeling that this is, this is going to be one you're going to get super passionate about. So I want to circle back to it. <laughs> um, you know, obviously this year was tough for a lot of people. We, we as an industry were deemed essential. You know, I imagine at that point, and we, you and I kind of touched on the California lockdowns beforehand, that when you were deemed essential or when cannabis was, that you kind of, I imagine that you and Tara and the rest of the team took that a little bit more to heart because you didn't have a retail location. So, you know, at that point, I'd imagine a lot of people in California were looking to the delivery services to continue to get what they needed. We saw a spike in sales for cannabis in general. We saw a spike in adoption. Um, and I mean, you know, it, people wanted to do delivery. They were, we didn't know what was going on at the beginning of this. We didn't know how dangerous it was to go outside and if masks work, if they didn't work, if being inside was bad or anything else like that. So, you know, take me back to, to the March timeframe when, when the, we got the essential label and, you know, how did you guys kind of react to that? I have to, I have to give a lot of credit to my partner, Tara, because she was, um, way before, even before the lockdown, she was putting into place uh, rules within the business to like make sure that we were cleaning things, to make sure that we, we've always paid sick leave, but really, really emphasize how people, if they think that they're exposed or if they're getting sick, stay home. Um, we started wearing masks before, in requiring masks in, among our employees before uh, 
there was any mask require, requirement in LA or before the CDC put out its support for masks. Um, and yeah, I mean, everyone remembers, everyone's experienced this of just like so much uncertainty of what it means, uh, what, what is going to happen. People, just as they were kind of clearing out the stores for food and toilet paper, people were ordering like crazy because they weren't sure if everything was gonna be shut down and if they'd ever have any more for the next like month or two. Um, Luckily things evened out, it was very stressful, um, but things evened out a little bit. Uh, and I think, I think cannabis is such the perfect drug for like hanging out at home. Um, when you have a lot of anxiety, like a pandemic might cause, when you have trouble sleeping, and when, you've, when you're not out at a bar partying, cannabis is like the perfect thing. It's great for sitting at home and watching TV or hanging out with your family or whatever. Um, so, you know, we, we noticed that, uh, and we talked to our customers about that, that they definitely, they felt like it was really helping them with their sleep and anxiety more, uh, and they were using it for that. And they started using more cannabis, um, sometimes even because they were like, you know, I've been drinking so much and this isn't good for my health to drink this much. I need something to relax, but that isn't going to like, you know, destroy my liver, or give me a hangover. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it's been booming. Um, and that's, that's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet because you, obviously we don't want the pandemic, but it's really, it's helped us, it's helped the entire industry um, to really pull through that compliance and tax and licensing fees hurdle that a lot of California was seeing at the, uh, right before the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that we've been able to provide this service, um, but it's, it's also, it's, it's been stressful. We, we do as much as we can. And luckily we've had no spread within the business um, among our employees of coronavirus. We had a couple at the very beginning who from community spread from like seeing friends or something like had gotten it, but we were able to catch it in time and quarantine them. Um, but it's, you know, everyone's gone through this. It's just, what do you think anymore? It's just so overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it really is. And I commend you on that too, because I mean, I don't know. I just feel like we're at a, we're at a weird inflection point here with, with the pandemic. And this is off topic a little bit where it's like, we, I want to feel like we can see the end, but we, we also don't know how far it is. We got the vaccinations coming numbers spiked again. I, I know here they're starting to trend down again. Finally, and it yeah. just seems like we've been doing it so long and we've all gotten used to this kind of altered reality. I mean, I still go out to eat. We're staying outside. Luckily, you know, it's winter in Florida, so it's actually tolerable, um, yeah. you know, and you guys don't have to worry about that in California. It's the biggest difference between Southern California and South Florida. When it's hot during the day for you, when the sun goes down, it's very bearable. When it's hot during the day in Florida, it's hot at night. So, you know, the sun goes down, it's 96 during the day, it's 94 at night. So that's what I'm jealous of. But yeah, I think it's weird. Like we're, we all like, we're ready for it to end, but it's still a freaking pandemic. So, yeah. you know, it's oh, really interesting. Go that on. That reminds me, I wanted to mention that, you know, obviously uh, a lot of people are using delivery for a lot of things now. And I think in many ways, this was where we were going anyway. I think... Um, you know, a lot of people had already started using Amazon, but maybe they hadn't had groceries delivered. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's kind of just taken our economy and our society and it's pushed them and said, yeah. you know what, this was maybe going to happen in five or 10 years. You're going to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of people are like, okay, I guess, you know, it's not so bad to get all these different things delivered. Um, and I think there's also space, uh, you know, you've, you've had a lot of, I don't know if this goes too much into like wonky economic stuff, but I've had a lot of big box retailers suffer from people like Amazon. If they haven't been able to find a way to change their model, you know, they're going to be outcompeted by Amazon on price yeah. and convenience. Um, what's still kind of a question up in the air are people who are the more local retailers, are the people who are able to either do a brand or do uh, curation or something like that, the, the smaller shops. 
And I think there's a way for them to do online delivery, just like how we're doing it, of creating a brand, of, of reaching a segment of the population and saying like, we can do what you need. We can curate, we can make it easy, like Amazon's easy, but we can also, but we're not so overwhelming. We're not every single thing. We're the things we know you're gonna like. If you like yeah. this, you're gonna like this. And that's what we've tried to capture with ours. And, and I feel like it's, you're starting to see smaller businesses do that as well. You're starting to see restaurants that have never delivered before go into delivery because kind of just being, that's the only way that they can survive. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult lesson that our economy is taking, but it's definitely, I don't think it's ever gonna go back. I don't think it's gonna go back to the way it was. It's, it'll definitely be better in the future when the pandemic is over but it's, it's going to be different. I, I got to be honest. I'm not sure I want it to go back a hundred percent. Yeah. That, right. <laughs> um, and it, it's funny. You're reading my mind. That's really where I was going to try to take you next, but this is a conversation that my wife and I had the other day. I mean, she basically, I forget, we're going to pick up something curbside and she's like, I hope this never goes away. Like she curbside, yeah. and, and you know, curbside isn't that much more convenient. It just, you still have to go to the place. You just don't have to get out of your car. It kind of makes everything a drive through. Right. And down here, like you said, we have restaurants that have set up makeshift drive throughs or they have a really good curbside service, and it really does make things more convenient. And at that point, it's kind of crazy when you talk about like human nature and everything else. I'm now more likely to pass on fast food or something convenient because they have a drive through and I'm in a rush because I can call ahead and order curbside. And yeah, it's not as quick as a McDonald's drive through Nobody really is or Chick-fil-A, they should be the ones handing out the vaccine with their coordination. But, <laughs> um, you know, it really honestly, for me now, I can look at the stores that have healthier options and everything else and place an order and pick it up curbside and get it almost as conveniently as fast food. So if we have yeah. people that are going to continue to do that, and I think our society as a whole, especially after this, is trying to be careful about what they put in their body, you know, why is there not a salad place that has a quick drive through? I mean, obviously I know there's logistics yeah. and freshness and all that stuff, but you know, there's a lot of smart people out there. So why don't we have healthy food drive throughs that are just as easy as McDonald's and maybe people would make better decisions. So on that note, I like a lot of the things that have come from the pandemic as far as ingenuity. And that's, you know, we get into an even higher level of, of view, like a lot of people have been very upset with the government during the pandemic and rightfully so, but you look at the ingenuity of the American people and the businesses and the entrepreneurs and even just the employees, you look at places like New York City and the fact that all these restaurants are taking advantage of their sidewalk space and street parking and just being so innovative. That's what really inspires me. And that's where I see the good that comes out of this pandemic was ingenuity people thinking outside the box and just realizing like they don't need to continue to do things the way they were doing it just because that's the way that it was done right so yeah. you know on that note too we talk with we'll circle this back to the cannabis industry you wrote an article recently saying that e-commerce is no longer not i'm going to word this wrong but basically cannabis companies need to have e-commerce at this point right it's not an option to not have it i'm really interested i mean i get why because it's 2021 at this point everybody needs at least a website but i mean are just are consumers just so conditioned to being able to go online and shop is, is that the reason yeah i think um it's interesting to think about how maybe that need for a third place of where we interact with our community isn't necessarily gonna be as tied to our retail activity. Maybe it's not gonna be the mall that we're going to, to like see strangers and see friends. Maybe it's gonna be a street fair or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in that reality, and it's already started to come there. You, you just, you have to find another way to connect with the, the customer. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like newspapers. People just changed the way that they consumed news media, or uh, it's happened across the media with, yeah. with music, with video, with movies, it's just changed. And so you have to adapt to that change. People are going to want different things and you can't tell them, no, this is what you should want. You have to be like, oh, let me meet you where you are. 
let me help discover new ways for you to do what what you prefer. Um, and you know, it's it's just it's just how it is, and it it just happened to have happened a lot faster than I think we were all comfortable with. <laughs> yeah, it it it's weird. It's almost like big box stores are going to become like what you need. And then mom and pop stores are going to become more experiential and, you know, getting yeah. to know the people in yeah. a smaller experience. Um, I definitely think so. You know, on that note of e-commerce, you know, the one I would say disadvantage that you have, you know, you do have a storefront, but just from a wider standpoint is bud tender education, right? Now, obviously I touched on it early. Not every bud tender knows what they're talking about. There are plenty of them that do, and there are plenty of great education programs. But for someone who is very novice, right, how do you guys deal with educating them on all the different products that are out there? If somebody happened to be, you know, they're, they're in California, they go to your website, and how do you prevent that overwhelming and, and get them to understand the difference between a vape a cartridge versus a concentrate versus flour, sure, versus, yeah. uh, even things like, you know, drinks, which is, is the thing I'm most interested in now. So... When we hire, you know, it's not required that they have to be passionate about cannabis, but we tend to attract people who are. We tend to attract people who are interested and passionate, and they tend to become more passionate the more that they learn. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of training of, you know, these, this is the compliance. You have to make sure you do all this kind of stuff when you're delivering. You have to make sure that, you know, you package it in this way. But we also just try to show people the products. We try to, uh, we give out as many samples as we can. We, you know, we encourage all of our vendors to, we used to have occasionally vendors come in and like do little presentations about their products, which we can't obviously do that right now. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's a constant learning experience, I think. And the longer that they that our employees have been with us, the more they learn. Um, so you know, we might start someone off driving, uh, and then and then maybe like uh, packing the orders. But then we might move them after they've been with us for a while. We might move them into customer service, where because they've they've reached that point where they know the products like the back of their hand. They understand how it affects different people, and also just by having a customer by training customer service to be really open to our customers. And a lot of times when, when someone calls, they have a problem. They're not happy usually. usually. Yeah. Um, and it's either they have a problem with you or they have a problem because they don't know what to get, whatever it is. And so you, you begin to learn like, okay, these are the types of problems people have. What is working for them? We get that feedback on a personal level because it is, it's hard as an e-commerce site to stay personal, to, to make yeah. that connection. And so you really, you have to ingrain it in your culture. You have to ingrain it in your processes and, um, and you get there, eventually you get there, but it just takes time and effort. Right. Yeah. It, it's interesting. And I commend you for that. Cause like you said, when it's e-commerce, it's, it's hard to keep that personal touch, but you know, I, I know there's a lot of born on the internet companies that I deal with in, I do have that kind of loyalty to them. And a lot of it had yeah. to do with their customer service. I mean, apparel companies like Bonobos and, and Indochino, you know, I think they kind of started that trend. Um, all right. So I want to circle back to the lawsuit, right? That's the most recent article I saw on you. No, but it's interesting, <laughs> right? Um, because, and, and I want to tell people, if they look at these articles to make sure you read the whole thing before you kind of pass any judgment, right? Because, on paper, a headline can make it look bad, but when you actually read into the details, what's going on is really not the best. So the city, and, and I'm going to do my best to summarize it, and you correct me, right? So the city of Los Angeles, essentially, they were having issues with, they, they weren't doing the social equity, right? And they decided to kind of throw their hands in the air and say, all right, all delivery licenses till 2025 are going to go strictly to social equity applicants, right? As opposed to yeah. anybody else. When realistically, it was just that they messed up the actual licensing for social equity that they just threw it all in the delivery licenses. Well, as much yeah. as we do want social equity in this place, there were other advantages to giving a license to people like you because there was a program where there was 
sharing and, and things like that and incubation and all that. Yeah. So because of that, no other delivery that company that's not a social equity applicant can get a license in the city of Los Angeles till 2025. So tell us about this because it, it's very interesting. And honestly, it's a little confusing. It sounds like, and I'll be the one to say this, not you, because you're involved in it. We got some really lazy regulators that just don't want to figure out a better solution. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's um, it is a it's a it's a complicated subject, um, and it's hard to perfectly encapsulate. But we, the the industry in in Los Angeles has been working with the city for a long time, and we, you know, I, I, I walked into those neighborhood councils talking about social equity. I am a huge proponent of the social equity program of the the idea of it. Um, I think that it is a, a brilliant way to really right some of the wrongs. And we're not gonna do a perfect job in that. It's not gonna be the only thing that does it, but right some of the wrongs of what our war on drugs has done and what our war on cannabis has done. Um, and so we had a system that was put into place in uh, 2017 that was a mixture of social equity, of making sure that legacy operators that had been there for a long time were able to get licensed and also gave, you know, made sure that they protected consumers, make sure that the city was getting its taxes. It was, it was an omnibus type of uh, bill. And it worked, we, we'd come to consensus, we'd gotten the communities to support us. Because a lot of the neighborhood councils, they were really uncomfortable. They were like, what is it gonna mean to have ca licensed cannabis in our, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, but everyone was on board. And then um, the, the bureaucracy that the city set up to administer the licensing, to regulate us, it ended up just making a lot of mistakes. It ended up being a lot slower than everyone expected. Um, and delivery was always gonna be one of the last to be licensed, but we expected last to be licensed as in like, end of 2018. So come summer of 2020, uh, or a little bit before the summer, um, the city suddenly it had a lot of problems with its social equity licensing. It ended up making mistakes. Some people were able to jump the line when they shouldn't have. Um, yeah. And so they were like, you know what, as you said, they were like, let's just throw delivery at them and push out every other applicant until 2025. And people like myself, we had invested in LA. This is my hometown. I wanted to see it succeed. Um, we had employed people, we put sweat and money. We, we had been sitting on laces for years longer than we thought we would. And to suddenly have it yanked away from us, um, once it seemed like we were actually close, uh, it, was, it was devastating. But then on top of that, a lot of these, a lot of the, the non-social equity licenses, we were incubating and paying fees and helping to fund the social equity side of the licensing. So I, it, it's even more confusing because I'm like the, the, the money that I'm putting in, the, the training, the help that I'm adding to the social equity program ensures that it's gonna be that much more successful. So, um, you know, some of the industry associations and myself, we, we decided that I should also be part of the lawsuit as an individual. Um, we wanted a face so that the city could see like this is, these are people who, you know, I might have to let go. These are, these are jobs. These are, this is money. This is everything that is, that could be lost. And it's a very real thing. It's not an amorphous thing. It's very real. Um, we decided to sue the city because it, it just felt like our last option. We were scrambling to do something. Um, and, but we want, I want to see the social equity program succeed. And I believe that what they've done has hurt it more than helped it. I believe that our solution of, you know, give us, you know, get, give the majority of licenses to social equity candidates, but still give us an option um, to help and, and take our fees and, 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 and uh, incubation to help that program. Um, I believe that that compromise is something that, that, that is still viable for the city. And so we're really hoping that we can come to a conclusion that helps everyone. Because I, I've seen so many legacy operators go bust waiting. I've seen so many of them just go right outside the city limits, set up a shop and still deliver into LA. So LA yeah. might as well be getting the taxes. 
um, I don't know. It's it, it's it's been really frustrating. We're really we're really trying to stay true to our beliefs and uh, in both social equity and in cannabis and in, in, in a healthy market that serves everyone. Um, and we just hope that we can convince the city that 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 way works for everyone. I, I, I you know, from an outsider looking in, I, I, I really agree with you, right? To throw all the social equity applicants into a specific license type is really a disservice to them, right? Because, you know, yeah. people making the application, I'm sure a lot of them didn't think, oh, we're going to be a delivery company. And there's different type of overhead that comes with that. And it could be higher yeah. because you have to have vehicles. And obviously you can't compete with just one. You're going to have to have multiple. You're going to have to have a warehouse to put everything in. You have to have insurance, which is going to be exponentially higher, right? Whereas you can bring in some of these, when I say these companies like you, like Ganja Goddess that has and establish SOPs and a company and everything else where you can look at the people who the social equity licenses that are already in LA and bring them onto the platform and promote them and give them more attention. It doesn't allow you to do that. And like you said, you know, obviously I don't know the fee structure and the incubation, but just having something in there where you're going to help them and make sure that they succeed. I, I really do think it is a disservice. So, you know, we're on paper where it's like, no, we're not fighting social equity. We're, we're making sure that they get the licenses that they need and that everybody has a fair shot. I mean, at the end of the day, equity is equity. Everybody should have a fair shot and we should do things to, to help the people that have been hurt by this, but it should be done the right way, right? And it should be done yeah. in a way that both they're comfortable with us, you know, comfortable with as well. So. You know, it's interesting, and that's why I want people to make sure that they read the entire article or anything else, because you really do have everyone's best interest at heart here. So yeah. I, I commend you on that. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. But like you said, you can you can still deliver to L.A. They're just not making any money off of it. So they're, they're yeah. really losing out. Yeah, definitely. So. Very cool, man. Well, listen, dude, I know, you know, I don't want to end on the sour note there with the lawsuit, but, <laughs> you know, you, since 2007, you and Tara have been killing it, you know, going from an edibles company to delivery company to opening storefronts, you know, we didn't even talk about up north. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're, there's always time to have you back, man. I commend you on everything that you've done. So before we let you go, uh, let's, let's promote the company. Let's tell everybody where they can find you. And if you're in California, where they can uh, place some orders. Yeah. So you can go online to ganjagoddess.com. Um, you can create a, an account. You can also call us. We have our phone number on the front page of the website. Um, and you know, we can, we can deliver to you. Uh, we do both medical and recreational. I, I really believe in everything that we carry. Um, and let us take care of you. Very cool, man. Zach, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, after all this goes down, we definitely want to have you back on, continue to talk. Um, if COVID ever stops, definitely come out to, to California and see you guys, but really appreciate your time, man. Well, thank you. I really, I've had fun talking with you and uh, yeah, have a good one. Very cool. And thank you to everybody at home. Folks, like I said, if you miss any part of this interview, it will be live on our YouTube channel and all of the uh, podcast platforms next week. Apple, iHeart, Stitcher, just search for Elevate Your Grind. If you want to see it on YouTube, the video version, obviously, is youtube.com slash Elevate Your Grind. Uh, tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. right here at facebook.com slash Canna Business Group, we'll be live with Best of Ola. And then, of course, February 6th, the annual C-Lab conference, socially distant. Go to joincelab.com. Folks, this has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. We'll see you tomorrow.